will at least know something about his background, or maybe some of you don't even get the newsletter. So for that reason, we need to go through it. Uh, he's with Creation Ministries International, the uh, U.S. Uh, organization, not the Australian one right now. Of course, they're all one and the same. He received his bachelor's in chemistry and his Ph.D. from Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. Yeah, he's a chemist just like me, and I don't have many of us that are out in the creation movement there. Uh, he's co-authored papers in mainstream science, including a paper on high temperature superconductivity, which I also have done, but uh, we're not talking about me. But nonetheless, he uh, did that and then published in the prestigious journal Nature, which is a very prestigious scientific journal, at the age of 22. He's long been interested in apologetics, co-find of the Wellington Creation Apologetic Society in New Zealand. He's wrote the book Refuting Evolution, which most of you may have seen. There are two, two editions of it. Um, he was uh, also uh, written that for a purpose to counter the teacher's guidebook from the National Academy of Sciences and uh, teaching about evolution and the nature of science. He's now got over 4,000 copies of that in print. I understand. Uh, he's then wrote Refuting Evolution Number 2, uh, which is an excellent book, uh, two editions of that, and he's highly acclaimed Refuting the Compromise. Uh, there are two editions of that as well. And uh, he has both responses. He attacks on the biblical view of uh, history plus the uh, booklet Mammoth, which is the riddle of the Ice Age. He's a co-author of Updated Creation Answers book, which most of us seem to know or have, 15 Reasons to Take Genesis as History. Um, he's finished uh, by design, the evidence of nature's intelligent designer, and we know who he is, the God of the Bible. And uh, he also wrote The Greatest Hoax on Earth, which is a response to Richard Dawkins. His latest book was The Greatest Show on Earth. And Jonathan, I read that book. Jonathan did an excellent job on that book, as well as all his other books. Uh, he is full-time with Creation Ministries now. He writes and reviews articles and peer reviews for the Journal of Creation. He's an accomplished chess player, I guess you know. Was a New Zealand former chess champion. So nobody dared to play him chess. Not I, for sure, because I haven't played chess since my college days, and I wasn't very good. <laughs> so his presentation this evening, an interesting topic and title, Are Miracles Scientific? Let's Jonathan speak. Tell us all about it. Here he is. Oh, good day. Well, thank you for coming uh, to, to hear me tonight, uh, especially on, on uh, a Friday night. I know it's often a date night in America. Yeah, actually, yeah, the first time I came to uh, Colorado was about three days after 9-11 to give some creation talks, so that's why I remember the, the, uh, the time quite well. Um, as you can tell, from just by listening to me say a few words, I'm not from this country. Here is where I do come from. <laughs> yeah, now you might, see Creation Ministries, by the way, is an equipping ministry. Our ministry is to equip the church, to give answers uh, to, the, uh, to the culture. How, how do we defend the Bible against all the attacks coming out and the new atheists have been much more aggressive? And let's face it, the culture has been undermined for the last few decades uh, where um, the, 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 the religion of the day is basically atheism. People might still go to church, but their, their overall philosophy for, for life tends to be atheism. That's why we have abortion on demand in this country. I don't think my country's any better. I'm not trying to, to, to knock your one. I think Australia has, its, has terrible problems that way. Um, the thing is, I think one of the biggest problems is that people don't know how to defend their faith. And that's why we do what we do. That's why we go to different countries and different places and we don't charge a set speaking fee for doing this. And just so you know, you might have seen a lot of DVDs in the, as part of our resources. Uh, they're spoken in Australian, but they're subtitled in American, so you guys can understand them. <laughs> and now another reason for me coming here, I've got two little granddaughters living in Florida. My wife is actually American. 
Now, I am a, a chemist by training. I'm a PhD scientist, uh, shown lasers at uh, selenium ring molecules like this and published work in real scientific journals, uh, specialist journals like this one. So don't let anyone tell you there aren't any real scientists who believe the Bible. Now, I'm also a, a chess master. That's a little hobby of mine, as was mentioned there. I've, playing at a creation camp there, blindfolded, and I've played with some good people in my time as well. Now, now just one more thing about where I come from. My name is actually Hebrew. It's the Hebrew word for Frenchman, so I'm actually ethnically Jewish. That means I can tell Jewish jokes and French jokes and get away with it. <laughs> now, if you know, want to know why a good Jewish boy like me would believe in Jesus, the Messiah, well, here are a couple of things that are, which are on special today. A, a book about how Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled the prophecies of the Hebrew Bible, starting right from Genesis 3. And the thing is that some of those prophecies had an expiration date. So I mean, no claimant today could be the Messiah because they must, it must have happened when he came. If he didn't come, he, he wasn't the Messiah, then no one else could be. And that's the sort of thing, both his book and DVDs uh, point to that. How it goes right back to the book of Genesis and how Genesis is foundational to understand Christianity because every doctrine we can think of in the Bible, in Christianity, has its foundations in the first uh, book of the Bible. And even Genesis 3.15, it talks about the seed of the woman coming to crush the head of the serpent. That's where we get the doctrine of the virginal conception from. Because he's a, he's a seed of the woman, no human father. So you see how all the doctrines go right back to the early parts of the Bible. Now this talk I'm giving is actually uh, probably one of my oldest talks, actually. I just said it's been uh, sort of uh, gathering dust for quite a few years and I've sort of uh, uh, revised it and updated it and used a modern technology like PowerPoint to, to make this talk. And there's also a, a website we have, creation.com slash miracles is our website, is from our website, creation.com. And in fact, we have an email newsletter which will help you um, sign up for, for creation information. It's called the Infobytes. It's totally free. We won't spam you. We won't give your address out to any third party, but it'll tell you some of the articles on our website. In fact, there's about almost 9,000 articles on our website. We have some shortcuts like this one, creation.com slash miracles. And this newsletter will also tell you about creation speakers in your area. So it's very well, well worth subscribing to. So I'm going to ask the uh, nice ushers to start passing around these uh, sign-up sheets. Uh, all you have to do is, is your name and your email address. So before I start talking, we get these clipboards circulating. Very simple to do. Name and email. It comes out about once a week, the news, uh, so it's not going to spam your inbox. Now let's uh, understand a little bit more about the, uh, what miracles are talking about. See, miracles, we might say, are extraordinary in intervention by God in the world. And I like to say that they're in addition to the natural laws of science, which I'll be talking about a bit later. That's the big difference. See, I don't want to overuse the word miracle because if you start saying that everything is a miracle, then really nothing is a miracle. It's an inflation of the, of the word. You know what inflation does to currency, it loses all its value. So if you overuse miracle, the word miracle, you're going to again lose its value because miracles were a, a sign of God's special activity. Now, the Bible certainly records lots of miracles, but in fact they're concentrated in certain specific periods and there are a lot of parts of the Bible where, where there aren't really any miracles as such. So the Bible is not really that full of miracles, you might say, because they're concentrated in certain times where God is setting a certain new direction for the, the world and especially for the Messianic people, the Jewish people, as he worked out his Messianic program throughout history. That's what the Bible's doing. It's a, it's a revelation of God's works in history. It's a real history book of the universe. So to start off with, obviously, there's the creation. Creation week is clearly a miracle. In fact, a huge number of miracles, you might say. And the important thing is, these were one-off acts over six ordinary 24-hour days about 6,000 years ago. I've got a typo here. It should be 6,000, not 60,000. Okay, 6,000 years ago, uh, because that's what you get from adding up the, the time information in the Bible. So 6,000 is about the right figure for that. And you've certainly got some, a, a distinctive order of events there as well because some people have tried to add millions of years to the Bible and pretend that the order of events in the fossil record matches the order in Genesis. It does no such thing. 
Because the Big Bang Theory says stars came before the Earth. The Bible says the Earth's day one and the stars are day four. You can't mix the two. Um, evolution says that whales and birds evolved from land creatures. The Bible says the whales and birds were on day five, the land creatures are on day six. So once again, the order is contradictory to the evolutionary order. And there are a few other uh, very good examples of things too. In fact, my, my book, uh, By Design, was my favourite book to write. It's about uh, so many examples of design in, in God's creation. And one of the most amazing proofs of that, I think, is how often humans are trying to copy what's in nature. It's a field called biomimetics, biomimicry. Uh, human designers are now making things that are getting all these wonderful ideas from what's in the natural world. And people think these scientists are so brilliant, but they're just making the copies. What about the, ones who, the one who made the original? Now, other Old Testament miracles, of course, you've got the flood. Was a, it was a major uh, miracle. That was a God's judgment on mankind. You ha- and, of course, before the flood, you had the fall. But Adam and Eve committed a real sin, and that was when God cursed the world with death. That's where death came from. So once again, you've got a, a definite um, discontinuity there of the fall, then you have the flood, and then you have the ba- Babel, where you have the confusion of tongues because they again disobeyed God. And a bit much more, much later than Babel, of course, you have the miracles of Moses. And you have miracles of nature. In fact, it seems that a lot of the plagues were attacks on the Egyptian false gods. Well, the, the Egyptians believed that gods were in charge of things, so God said that he, he proved he was the one in charge of them, and their false gods were impotent in the face of the power of a true God. And again, Moses was the beginning of the giving of the law. So again, you have the special uh, uh, number of miracles there to authenticate Moses' ministry, the giving of the law. So these are, are special times in God's working out his plan through history. You have these special times of miraculous activity. And we have other parts of the Old Testament as well. See, Elijah and Elisha were times of healing, even raising the dead. Now again, see, between Moses and Elijah, there weren't that many times of miracles. But when you have Elijah and Elisha, there seems to be a lot more miracles there. Now see, these guys were the beginning of the prophetic ministry. These are the forerunners of the prophets. So once again, you have this uh, explosion of God's miraculous acts to authenticate the ministry of the prophets. Now then you have uh, quite a big break between the Old Testament, a 400 year gap between the close of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. In fact, the Jewish authors, the Jewish people realize, well, hang on, prophecy is no longer in Israel. And that's uh, one argument I have against uh, the Apocrypha being inspired because the authors of the Apocrypha recognized that prophecy had disappeared. So therefore they were disclaiming that they were prophets of God writing those books. They were clearly ordering people. But of course, uh, the New Testament is the beginning of the most important thing of all, when God himself, the second person of the, of the Holy Trinity, took on human nature in the incarnation. Now, here's a little question for you, because I'm going to ask, uh, you're going to guys have a chance to ask me some questions. Now, what I might do, though, to make it as easy as possible, especially for those with young families, is to have a break for about 20 minutes so you can look at some of the resources. That's how I find it works better. Have a look at some of the resources we have uh, for about 20 minutes, and then those who want to stay behind, I'm very willing to answer questions on creation and evolution and the, t- and the topic I'm talking about tonight. But I always suggest having a break to have a look at some of our material before the Q&A time. So if you're going to ask me questions, I'm going to ask you one. How's that? Can you tell me, what was Jesus' first miraculous act recorded in the Gospels? Okay. Mm. Mm. Okay, I wasn't trying to trick you, okay? See, the water and the wine, that's John chapter 2, the wedding at Cana, which was said to be the, f- the first sign to the disciples. But the point is, before that, before John chapter 2, there's John chapter 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, He was with God in the beginning. Well, who are we talking about here? Exactly. But then it tells us, through Him all things were made, without Him nothing was made that has been made. So you see, even before he was born, Jesus was the creator of the world. And this is recorded in the Gospels. This has to be the first miracle in the Gospels. And it's pretty important because uh, if Jesus is not the creator, he can't be the recreator, he can't be our redeemer unless he's the creator in the first place. 
Now, of course, the New Testament, uh, loads of miracles, like, for instance, the incarnation, God took on human nature. And there's an article on the website I wrote a while, a couple of years ago, creation.com slash incarnation. So that's what I'm saying. A lot of these shortcuts are very easy to remember. I'm certainly hoping that our website, creation.com, is easy to remember. So this is a very important thing. Now, the incarnation is when God added humanity. He didn't give up his divinity. He added humanity to himself. And this happened from conception. Because people talk about the uh, virginal, virgin birth, which I don't think is, is actually quite as good a term as virginal conception because it was a conception that was miraculous, not the birth. The birth was an ordinary birth. The conception was what was miraculous. And another article here, creation.com slash virgin, about all these things, defending the virgin birth, uh, virginal conception against critics. And of course, uh, while he was on earth, he did lots of miracles of nature. He showed he is the creator. He has power over nature. That's one of the points he has. He has the power of life over death. The maker, the the giver of life, uh, could even raise people from the dead, like Lazarus. And of course, turning water into wine, as you remember from your false, your, your, your the faulty guess you had. Yes, okay. Um, and other things, uh, for instance, uh, he said things like, uh, "He, the, the Son of Man, is the Lord of the Sabbath." Well, he, that's only possible if he's the one who gave the Sabbath in the first place. So again, it's always, always pointing to his divinity there. And of course, uh, the cult, uh, culmination was rising bodily from the dead, showing that he was who he said he was. It authenticated who he was, that he wasn't an ordinary man, but in fact, God as he claimed to be. And he appeared to 500 people at once to, as, as a hugely well-attested fact of history. Now, one thing we, we uh, are supposed to do as Christians, which I hope is why you have a, a great group like this, is to be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that is in you, which is one great motivator for, for ministries like CMI, that we are supposed to have reasons for what we believe. And Jesus himself said the greatest command was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and all your strength. I didn't see anything in there about having to check your brains in at the church door. That's not what it's supposed to be about. There's no need to turn your brain off to be a Christian. And there's the other thing here. See, this passage here is sort of like a positive case, giving the positive case for Christianity. There's also the opposite side of the same coin. We're supposed to demolish arguments against the faith. Now, I didn't say demolish the person. I said demolish the arguments. That's what we are supposed to do. Uh, Faulty arguments are a stumbling block for people coming to saving knowledge of Christ and it's our job to demolish these arguments. This is a major part of, again, what what CMI does as a ministry. Now, let's now talk about what laws of nature are. I mentioned laws briefly uh, in the introduction. So let's look at them in a bit more detail there because I think they're a bit misunderstood as well. So I'd like to have this, uh, this uh, diagram here again. Now, see, the laws of nature should be understood as descriptions of the regular, repeatable, observable processes of nature. Uh, I don't think you could, it's really right to say laws of nature cause anything. You see, what I've got here is a, is a, is a map here. Why is the map shaped like this? It's because it describes the shape of the coastline. The map didn't cause the coastline shape. Rather, it described what was already the coastline shape. And I think the same with natural law. Natural law is, a, is man's description of something which is already occurring regularly and repeatedly. And in fact, as Dr. Geisler said, one of the leading Christian apologists, he says that natural law is a description of the way God acts regularly in and through creation, whereas a miracle is a way that God acts on special occasions. Natural law describes the gradual activity of God in the world, whereas miracles manifest as immediate actions. You see how both natural laws uh, and miracles are God's action, but natural law is the way God normally upholds his creation, as uh, Colossians 1.15 tells us, and miracles are just extraordinary ways instead of ordinary ways. So that's the, that's the big difference. Now let's see what, what the um, enemies of Christianity have tried to say about miracles. Now one of the leading ones was David Hume in, in the period called the Endarkament. I think he called it the Enlightenment. That's not what I call it. 
See, the indictment was when people decided to reject God's revelation in the Bible and use their faulty uh, human reasoning. Instead of using human reasoning um, from the biblical passages, they decided to use human reasoning without the Bible. Going back to the time of Adam and Eve, trying to do things their own way apart from God. And David Hume was one of the leading uh, people in this. Because he tried to attack uh, miracles uh, in, in a big way. And his argument was something like this. He said, we have uniform experience, experience against miracles. We, we don't see miracles happening very much. And also miracles are exceptions to natural laws. And of course we know that natural laws have no exceptions. Therefore miracles are disproven, he says. But let's look at this in a bit more detail there. But see, how do we know we have uniform experience against miracles unless we know that all reports of miracles are false? You see, he is using the supposed uniformity to try to disprove the miracle reports. But that's what he needs to prove in the first place. You see, he's assuming what he needs to to prove. It's in fact what you call circular reasoning. He has to assume uh, the the, uh, inviolability of natural laws uh, to try to prove it. So, so he hasn't really proved anything. He's, just, he's making a decree. He's not making any real uh, proof at all. He's assuming that there aren't any miracles to prove there are no miracles. It's a very bizarre thing to have to do. Another thing I like to do, do to, in response to people like that is to ask them where do they get their idea of natural law from. Now, tomorrow night, if you want to come, there's a different creation group which has kindly inv- invited me, and I'm talking about the Christian roots of science. That's tomorrow night. Okay, but briefly, what I'm going to point out here is that in fact the whole idea of science and regularity of nature came from the Christian foundation. Because, you see, if Zeus and his gang were in charge, the Greek gods, there's no reason to believe the universe would be regular because every god has his own different rules. And they're capricious gods as well. They can change their mind at any moment. And if there's no God, once again, why should the universe be regular? It was only the assumption of a divine lawmaker. And the, the Bible tells us that God is not the author of confusion, but a God of order. That was what led to people like Sir Isaac Newton developing his all his science. And earlier than Newton, you have Johann Kepler saying he was thinking God's thoughts after him. These guys all thought they were trying to discover the way God was upholding his creation. So the whole idea of a regular natural law comes from a Christian foundation. So once again, the atheists are actually cutting off their, the branch they're sitting on because they're assuming, they're trying to attack Christianity by assumption which can only come from Christianity because you can't get regular nature from an atheistic worldview. If we just rearrange pond scum, there's actually no reason to believe the universe is regular. So only the Christian, foundation, Christian worldview can give us any reason to believe in regularity, but the Christian worldview also tells us that God has done things above and beyond his regular actions. So this is what I like people to do, is to think, well, let's see, you justify your own starting assumptions. They cannot do, uh, they attack miracles from the supposed uh, proof of uniformity of nature. They can't prove uniformity of nature from their own assumptions. And in fact, you can't prove it scientifically because the, if you try to prove uniformity of nature from science, those scientific experiments presuppose uniformity. So once again, they're trying to presuppose what needs to be proven. It just can't be done. Now, another thing about natural laws is misunderstood by a lot of the critics of the Bible. And that is, is they, they uh, presume isolated systems. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. See, here's again Sir Isaac Newton, who is probably the greatest scientist who ever lived. And by the way, Sir Isaac wrote more about the Bible than he wrote about science. And yet his scientific contributions were amazing. And the law of gravity, the laws of three laws of motion. He discovered the spectrum of light, which is my area of spectroscopy. The law of cooling was him. He jointly invented calculus. He invented the reflecting telescope. But with all those achievements to his name, he wrote more about biblical history, defending the authority of the Bible. 
Now let's look at one of his most famous laws. It's the first law of motion. You see, it says an object is going to keep on going at a constant speed in a straight line. Okay, that's what Newton's first law says. But there's a proviso there. The proviso is that no other forces are acting. Okay, that's the thing. If there are other forces acting, then of course things don't go in a straight line. But I think the argument against miracles, in fact, is like saying there, there can be no unbalanced forces. But in fact, this is, this, the first law of motion does not say there can't be forces. It just tells you what would happen if there aren't any forces. And things will just keep on going in a straight line. If you shoot a bullet in, in space, it's going to keep on going straight. There's no, no uh, air resistance in space. It will keep on going. So, I mean, I know uh, if you watch Star Trek, they talk about running out of fuel before we get to the destination, but you don't actually need fuel uh, if you're going at a, at a constant speed. Fuel is only needed if you want to uh, slow up or, or speed up or slow down or change direction. If you, if you want to go in a straight line, you don't need fuel because of Newton's first law. But there are a lot of dubious uh, part physics stuff in Star Trek. I like Star Trek a lot, but there's a lot of scientific pseudoscience in that, goodness. The point is, if, if, there were, if you can't allow an unbalanced force, then no object could ever change direction. But you see, the argument against miracles is like saying the, second, the first law of motion prohibits things changing direction. So I'll give you another example of this, uh, of this case here. And this actually comes from a real attack on Jesus I read. He thought he'd been very clever. Uh, see, Jesus was, said, was reported to have walked on water, and reports are, uh, are of course, factual reports very reliable report that he in fact did walk on water. But this uh, person here said he couldn't have done that because of Archimedes' principle. Now what does Archimedes say? He said, uh, Archimedes, uh, an object will sink in water if they weigh more than the buoyant force. See, if you want to be technical about it, what happens is that, that an object is going to displace a certain amount of water and the buoyant force is equal to the, the weight of the water displaced by it. So if the object is denser than water, it's, the, the, the weight is going to overbalance the buoyant force, and the object will sink. Okay, so therefore he said Jesus couldn't have walked on water because he would sink, because of this principle. But hang on, here's again the same principle. This again assumes there's nothing else in play. And he got to this commentary, William Barclay wrote a whole lot of New Testament commentaries. He was also sceptical of this miracle. He was sceptical of quite a few miracles. I don't know why uh, evangelicals think he's such a great guy when he was quite sceptical of biblical miracles. And again, because he didn't really understand much of the logic that I'm talking about in this talk here. But let's look at this uh, attack. You see this picture here. See, what I'm talking about here, see, if it was just the, the, the swimmer here, this diver or whatever he is, he's being rescued by a helicopter. If it was just the diver's weight and the buoyant force, he would sink. But if, that's only if nothing else is going on. The helicopter can provide a force upwards, though. Archimedes' principle is not being violated here, but what you have is an addition to the system. That's the thing. There's, a, there's an additional force provided by the helicopter upwards. And that's why this, this guy doesn't sink. There's no, there's no violation of any principle here. It's just an addition to the principle. The principle was not enough. It, did, it, it was assuming a certain uh, system where nothing else was operating. But here, in fact, there is something else operating. Now, this doesn't violate any principle. Now, once again, when you have Jesus, of course, Jesus is God. There's no such thing as an isolated system. Jesus can uh, apply a force if he wants to. You see, it wasn't just the weight force and the buoyant force. Jesus is God. He applies another upward force. Again, Archimedes is not being violated, but in fact, the assumption was made that there was nothing else in play. You see, once again, the atheists are assuming what they need to prove, that there's nothing else operating. It sounds so scientific, but they misunderstand uh, the limits of science. And that uh, goes on to the next uh, part I'm talking about, is that, that is to make sure to regard miracles as additions to the laws rather than violations of them. Because I've given you two examples here of whether, whether the miracle is in fact an addition to the law, not a violation. 
Now, C.S. Lewis, who wrote a really good book on miracles, and every one should have a look at that book. It's a very, very, very finely uh, argued book. Now, he gave the example of the incarnation. Now, again, the virginal conception. What happens? Well, Mary was didn't know a man, so the Holy Spirit provided the male genetics. He fertilized the Mary's egg cell. But you see, once that happens, uh, then the, the embryo develops in an ordinary manner. That's what I'm saying. There's nothing miraculous about Jesus' uh, growth in the womb, the gestation, or the birth. That was natural law. The, the addition came at conception, where the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. So once again, the, mir- the miracle is probably uh, said to be an addition to the system, not a violation of the law. Now, I do say that that Mary uh, had to provide genetic material because Jesus in the Bible is said to be a descendant of David and of Abraham and of Adam. And we also see in the Bible, in the prophet Isaiah said in chapter 59, it talked about the, the coming kinsman redeemer. Now, if you understand the biblical kinsman redeemer, look in the book of Ruth. The whole point of a kinsman redeemer is that he's related by blood to those whom he redeems. And that means that Jesus must be our blood relative to be our redeemer. And that is, it requires him to be a descendant of Adam and all the rest of us, no matter what people, group, or race we come from, we all come from Adam. And therefore, Jesus is our blood relative. Therefore, he can be our kinsman redeemer. That's why it's very important that Jesus was a physical descendant of Mary. Mary really was, did provide genetic material for Jesus. I know some people have rejected that, but they're, they're wrong for the reasons I've stated. Now, original sin wasn't transmitted once again because the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit prevented original sin being transmitted. So that's the solution in case you're worried about that. The Holy Spirit's overshadowing prevented original sin. Now, so this, so the, this is one way of understanding miracles, the idea of them being additions to natural law, not to violations. I think that, that should solve most of the problems. Now, let's look at some other things, uh, arguments against it. Are miracles a threat to science because how can we stop them happening in a science lab? Well, here again, it's a, it's a case of what God we believe in. We don't believe in gods like Zeus and his gang, okay? We believe in the God of order as revealed by the Bible, not just any old God. That's the whole point. It's about who we believe in, the God who has revealed himself in the scriptures and in Jesus Christ is not the God who would just intervene for the sake of it. <coughs> now let's look at a few other things here. I mean, one argument that you get from some of the new atheist crowd is if we believe the biblical miracle reports, why not believe all the other miracle reports? But that's like saying that because some politicians are, are trustworthy, all politicians are trustworthy. It's a logical fallacy. The point is the evidence for the biblical miracles is strong. The evidence for some of the counterfeit religions' miracles is, is weak. That's the thing. The, again, the atheist is presuming what he needs to prove, that all the, the holy books are equal, which is just not the case. The Bible is attested by history. Uh, the, the Christian religion has a religion founded by a saviour who rose from the dead. Muhammad just rotted in his tomb. The founders of other religions, they stayed dead. Jesus did not. That's the big difference between the Christian religion and all, the, all its competitors. We have a living saviour. Now let's look at another thing here um, about this. Because there are hoax miracles around, therefore all miracles are false. But the I main thing is, uh, that means if, if counterfeit money proves there isn't such a thing as real money. But in fact, I'd say it's more like the opposite, because why would you bother counterfeiting something which is false? In fact, I'd say that the fact that we have counterfeits shows there's something real to counterfeit. And I believe Satan is a counterfeiter of God, and therefore there may be satanic miracles, but they're the counterfeits of the real ones. Here, he is not really very original. He is a counterfeiter. And the thing is, the counterfeit is almost a proof that there is an original to counterfeit there. Now, listen, look at another one, uh, important point here. I want to again point out that this, I'm not just believing in any sort of designer, but I'm believing in the God who reveals himself in Scripture. Now, you have this very important passage that God told Moses 
Uh, if a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces a miracle, a sign of wonder, and if a sign of wonder of which he has spoken takes place and he says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and all your soul. The point is, just a miracle by itself is not proof of anything. If, if a miracle worker says something contrary to what God has revealed in Scripture, we are to reject that person, even if he does what we think are miracles. And that's a very important point. Uh, Satan is a counterfeiter. Maybe there are some things he does. But again, it's okay, what does the person say? Is a person in accordance with Scripture or is he contrary to Scripture? And I think some of the, there are false prophets around who claim to do miracles, but they teach so many heretical doctrines. So we must reject them because we have God's final word in the Bible. That, is, that must be our, our, our starting point, what God has revealed in Scripture. Miracles must not be our starting point. Experience must not be our starting point. Experiences and miracles must be judged in accordance with what the Bible tells us. But then the question uh, then arises of why should we trust the Bible above anything else? Well, let's look at some, uh, some of that. There, there's a test from uh, the apologist John Warwick Montgomery, who is also a legal scholar, one of the leading apologists in this country. Now, what, some of the things he, he's brought out about looking at the Bible is what people will do as, as for documents in general. And one of the things that's always been the rule is that you give the benefit of the doubt to the documents, not to the critic. That's one thing. A lot of the people like Hume and the skeptics, they regard the Bible as guilty until proven innocent. That is not the standard way of dealing with documents. And the other thing is there are, there are other um, corroborating accounts from other people, like, for instance, the Jewish Talmud, a very anti-Christian book, but it had to concede that Jesus did miracles. They had to try and explain those miracles away, but still there was a, there was a concession that he did do these miracles. So you have these hostile witnesses uh, from around, the, around that time that Jesus did the miracles he, he said he did. And there are things here about uh, the uh, authentic nature of the test. Now, uh, authentic uh, in this case means what, do we, what does what we have match what the original authors have? See, authentic is not saying in itself that the reports, the originals are true. It's saying that we have, the text we have is pretty close to what the original authors had. Now, when you look at the Bible, what we have here, these are actually um, papyri from, this is actually one thing, it's different, the, the, the the top and the bottom side of the same thing. You see the mirror images there? Because one's the top side, one's the bottom side. That's the earliest manuscript of the Bible of the New Testament in existence. It goes back to 8125. So that's very, very close to the uh, time when the Gospel of John was written, about 90 AD. So about 35 years after the original, which is incredible. By, by the standards of ancient history and the, and the classical uh, studies, this is incredible. I mean, nothing in the classical literature even comes close to this. How these ancient things. Also, we have so many different manuscripts of the Bible too. We have a wealth of evidence to support the New Testament, which we just don't, don't have for all these other works of classical antiquity. But no one doubts those other works. I mean, for instance, we have things like Plato and Caesar, all these things, but the earliest manuscripts of those books are over a thousand years after the, they were written. And yet the classical scholars have no doubt that we actually have what they wrote. And we only have a handful of those manuscripts as well, compared to the, the, well, the huge number of New Testament manuscripts in, in Greek, but also translations and quotations in the Church Fathers. It's nothing like that in the rest of classical literature. So if you throw out the New Testament, everything else has to get thrown out. Now, a lot of these liberal uh, theologians at some of the uh, theological cemeteries, I mean seminaries, um, <laughs> They, they, they don't trust the Bible, but the classical scholars in the same university just think they're, they're nuts. They're, they're, they're totally envious of the amount of evidence that they, ha they have for the, for the New Testament uh, compared to what they have for their own classical studies. And then you've got to ask, I mean, okay, we've got that established, that what we have is, 
incredibly close to what was originally written. That's one thing we've established, the authenticity of the reports of the miracles. The other thing is, did these Bible writers tell the truth? Now, there, again, uh, this is Simon Greenlee from Harvard. Now, now, his criteria for establishing the truth of witnesses are, is, are used in courts of law around the Western world. And there are certain tests that are used, they're standard tests. And let's apply them to the New Testament documents. For instance, honesty. Now, one thing you notice about the Gospels is how they were very open about the failings of the disciples. In fact, the disciples come across as a little bit thick, don't they? I mean, Jesus seems like he's almost losing patience with, with how slow they are to understand things. You see, these are um, very self-criticism is, is so, so rife through the Gospels. Uh, about how, but then, when it came to Jesus, Jesus was sinless and perfect. But the the, the Gospel writers uh, were, were really not that, that bright. According to the, they were very honest about their own failings. And you see that in the Old Testament as well. Now, you consider some of the ancient writings from Egypt and the Hittites. They never admitted defeat. The Pharaoh is always wonderful. He always won his victories. Of course, when you have the Hittites and the Egyptians both claiming to, to win the Battle of Karka, they obviously don't, didn't both win, did they? But you see, the, New Testament, the Old Testament was very open about the failings of the Jewish people. When they disobeyed God, God judged them, and the Bible is open about recording those failings. This is something quite uh, uh, unusual in the ancient world to be so honest about the failings. Now you look at the book of Mark's gospel. Mark was a disciple of Peter and it seems that Peter was quite insistent that Mark point out the failings of Peter in that gospel. Now, Jesus even said, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. Goodness, it's you know, pretty harsh words. But also the ability of the, the writers is, is beyond question. You think of, uh, you've got a couple of fishermen there, but even they were pre- wrote some pretty good stuff, really. I know that they didn't come across well in the gospel, but when you look at uh, how they wrote... They, they knew how to write, to write things and record things accurately. Uh, Paul was a disciple of, of the great Rabbi Gamaliel. Uh, Matthew was a tax uh, collector who clearly knew how to do figures and how to take notes accurately. That's what, what tax collectors could do. Uh, Luke was an incredibly good historian. Again, William Ramsey, about 100 years ago, tried to disprove a lot of Luke's references in the book of Acts, and yet he found that Luke was accurate over and over again, the weird names that the leaders of a a particular region had, and he got them right every time. A man who's incredibly good at detail. He's also a physician, and that came across in the Gospels too. And you have multiple witnesses to the events, but again, no collusion between them. That's why you've got certain differences, because uh, you've got two witnesses, good witnesses to the same events, and they'll have different accounts. They'll both they'll emphasize different things, but the, the overall picture is coherent. So this is what we, uh, what we have in the Gospels. So once again, the Gospels give every indication of recording accurately what the miracles recorded in them. So uh, there's, there's just no doubt, uh, just using ordinary secular criteria, how we should trust the reports of the Bible. But the thing is, the, the anti-Christians, they will doubt the Bible because, they, well, first of all, they say, we can't trust the miracles because they're recorded in the Bible. Why don't you trust the Bible? Because they record miracles. So, so, so once again, round and round in a circle they go. No attempt to sort of work out independently whether the Bible was accurate. Now, another charge has been made, and you see it again in a lot of the new atheist literature that some of the Christian miracles were basically copied off pagan miracles. And this, you get this a lot. Like, I mean, even back in New Zealand, the, the head of the religious studies department of my university was an apostate called Lloyd Gearing, and he was saying that the resurrection of Jesus came from the Mithra miracle around that time. So there's an article, on the, again, on our website, creation.com slash copyright. See, again, how we try to put these summaries in, and this is for you to have uh, if you want more information. So let's look at some of the, the claims here. One is a very important one, is who derived from whom. You see, when you look at things like Mithra, the earliest accounts of the, the supposed parallels post-date Christianity by a couple of centuries. So clearly it was the Mithra things that were copied from the Christian ones. So just a simple analysis of the history shows that the, the, the copycat must have been the other way around. 
And I think going back to the Old Testament as well, you think of uh, the liberals say that the Noah's flood account copied from Gilgamesh. But again, it had to be the other way around. The one clear proof of that is the shape of the ark. You see, the Bible has an incredibly seaworthy vessel. Korean naval architects look at the ark, they analyze the ark the same way as they analyzed the ships of the Korean Navy and found it was so stable that even the tsunami would knock it over. Waves several times, uh, about three times higher and a tsunami would not have knocked the ark over. That's how stable it was. But the Gilgamesh ark was a cube. Now, how ridiculous is that? A cube is so top heavy with top cap size. It's a ridiculous shape for a vessel. But when you think about it, though, so the Bible gives three dimensions. Now, when it goes into legend, it's much easier to remember one dimension of a cube than three dimensions of the ark. And the Babylonians were no, nowhere near the sea, so they didn't know any better. So that's why, why it's quite obvious that the Gilgamesh ark is the copy and the Noah's ark is the original. And then again, other parallels, even genuine, is another question. Because you think of um, the virginal conception of Christ. Now, some have said, well, my Perseus was conceived by Zeus and a mortal woman. But in fact, that was not a virginal conception. It was just a, a very promiscuous God having sex with mortal women. A virginal conception, by definition, means that no intercourse has taken place. Okay? So, again, there's just no parallel between what happens with Perseus and with what happened with Jesus. There's, again, it's, it's just not... When you look at it in more detail, the parallel just is, disappears. It's a very superficial way of looking at some of these parallels. But a deeper, uh, looking at them deeper, you find the parallel is not there at all. Another one is the Egyptian god Osiris who is supposed to have been a, a parallel for the resurrection. But the thing is, he remained as the god of the underworld. There was no resurrection. He stayed underground. Unlike Jesus who came up and, and, and the, the vacated the tomb and appeared to people above the ground, he ascended into heaven. Said, Again, look at it in more detail. It's just not there, the, the, the parallels. And the final thing is that Christ was a historical figure known by the people who wrote about him and also known by his enemies too. The enemies knew who he was. He was a historical figure, a contemporary of them. While you think is, no one who recorded the myths of Hercules or Perseus knew these guys because they, they didn't exist. They were uh, figures in the distant past, not figures of history. So once again, you, the parallel is just not there. And another obvious one is that the eight earliest Christians were Jews, not pagans, and they hated paganism. You think of, of Paul and Barnabas going to, to Lystra, and the, the inhabitants uh, thought they were gods, and they, they, they tore their, their cloaks. They were so horrified of being thought of being mistaken for, for, for pagan gods that they just had no love for paganism. So the idea that they would be the ones to mix uh, pagan, paganism into Christianity is just, they're the wrong sort of people to do it. Of all the people in the ancient world, the Jews are the last people to have done that. Now, I'll just give you one example of, of how this can be used. I mean, there are, uh, an article in Free Inquiry came out earlier this year. Was, in fact, they, they were urging people to give it to their elderly parents in nursing homes who might be Christians to try to, get, to, to undermine their Christian faith. And one thing was to say that Christmas is pagan. But once again, oh, let's look at this in some detail here. The point is, you see, again, it's a matter of who borrowed from who, because here is the first uh, account of Christmas at the 20, 25th of December date. Now, I'm not saying that Christ was born on that day. I don't really know when he was born, okay? But see, it goes back to Hippolytus in AD 202. He quite clearly pointed to the 25th of December as a debate. I'll, I'll tell you how he got that in a moment. But you see, the, the uh, Sol Invictus or Unconquered Sun, that is 72 years later. So again, the, the, the who borrowed from whom? Clearly the, the Roman emperor was trying to counterfeit the Christian ceremony, not the other way around. And where the, where the, the date came from is actually a Jewish tradition, not a, a pagan tradition. You see, the Jews had this uh, tradition called the integral year. Any one of their great prophets they believed would have an exact number of years in his lifespan. And they dated life from conception, and quite rightly so. I know this government doesn't, but uh, a Bible and science date life from conception. 
So they believed that a prophet would die on the same day he was conceived, the anniversary of his conception. So when Jesus died in around the April time, and they calculate that, that means he must have been conceived in that same date, and then they worked nine months from that date. And that is where they got the 25th of December date. And the Eastern Church had a slightly different date of the, of the 6th of January. That is where it came from. I'm not saying they're right. I'm just saying this is where it came from originally, and the pagans were the copyists. Now, if you wanted to see more, I just want to mention some of the books that you have here. See, this is a very new book we have called Christianity for Skeptics. And this goes into some of the material I've, I've, I've discussed about the reliability of miracles and the reliability of the Bible. There's a whole chapter on why we should trust the Bible and how we know Jesus rose from the dead. And it's full colour illustrated as well. It's just a brand new book that we've done because, see, creation ministry has mostly been a creation ministry. We, we, we talk about the authority of the Bible as it pertains to creation from the, uh, from the triune God revealed. And, of course, we're an overtly Christian ministry but this is the first book that we've produced that actually defends why we should trust the Bible as a whole, why we should believe Jesus and not Muhammad or the other f- false religions. This is a, we're pretty uh, um, um, keen on seeing this book because it sort of almost underpins everything else that we do because we as a ministry, we don't want to point people to Jesus Christ. We're not just about uh, creation for its own sake or bashing evolution for its own sake. We want to get, have people having saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's the, what CMI exists for. And creation is just a means to the end. Now, one last thing I'm going to go through is this idea of chronological snobbery. And this is a term I got from C.S. Lewis as well. I get a lot of stuff from C.S. Lewis, as you can imagine. Now, you see, here is, is a charge against the Bible writers that somehow the ancient people were ignorant. That's why they could believe in miracles, because they didn't know anything about, back in those days. We know better in our days. We're, we're not so ignorant. But let's think about this. Go, go back uh, to the account, you see. Uh, when you look at uh, the Annunciation to Mary and to Joseph, look at Matthew's and Luke's Gospel. See, Mary, when the angel announced to her that she would give birth to a son, she said, how could this be? I don't know a man. Yes, yeah, she knew very well it took a man to have a baby. They, she probably didn't know about uh, sperm and egg and, and fertilization and, and gametes and those sorts of things and DNA combined, but she certainly knew that it took a man. And Joseph likewise. We see when, when the angel announced her, when, she, when he realized Mary was pregnant, he wanted to divorce her because he obviously thought she must have been with a man to be pregnant. And again, the angel Gabriel told her him what really had happened. But the thing is, they doubted. Well, they, they were questioning more than doubting. They were questioning because they did know the facts of life. Just as much as we do today. Just not some of the fine details, but they certainly knew the facts of life. And similarly, when you've got um, uh, Jesus going to raise Lazarus from, from the dead... And the people around him said, well, hang on, you better not go in there because it's going to stink by now. You see, they knew very well that dead bodies were rot and stink. Just as much as we do today. They didn't know some of the very fine details about how bacteria decomboxylate amino acids and form putrescine and cadaverine, which then activate olfactory receptors. Okay, they didn't know some of the fine details, but they very knew, knew very well that dead bodies rot and stank. You see, so again, it's a total misunderstanding of details as opposed to the basic facts of life, which they knew just as well as we did. Now let's look at another charge, how gullible the ancients must have been. But the thing is, how can we possibly talk about gullibility of the ancient world when most of our newspapers have horoscopes in them? (laughs) And of course, the, the religion of the public schools is that we all came from pond scum. That's pretty gullible, I think. And the other thing, uh, what uh, they think that the, the Bible accounts for myths. But the thing is, C.S. Lewis, he was an expert on myth. That was his professional field. That was the area of expertise, was myths. He was an Oxford professor on myths. And he said that the New Testament was not mythological. And he challenged these, new t- these liberal theologians. What, do, you, do you know anything about myths at all? They, they clearly had never read a myth in their life if they thought the New Testament was mythological. 
In fact, we do see a mythological development. Some of the apocryphal gospels, that shows what myths do look like, how, how ridiculous some of the things and how capricious they, they were uh, and the, the, the things that Jesus is supposed to have done as a child and quite arbitrary. See, that is what myths look like. That, that's uh, several centuries after the New Testament. The New Testament is actually a very sober uh, book by comparison. These guys just had no clue about literature. So let's look at some uh, summary of things here. Now the first one is what I started with, that the Bible tells of many miracles, and here are some very important ones. Creation and the resurrection of Christ are important for the Christian faith, vital for the faith. We're dead in our sins if Jesus didn't rise. And the, the objections from the atheists like Hume basically have to argue in a circle. There's no way of breaking that circle. And some more uh, things to, to take away is that miracles are rarely additions to natural laws, but only a Christian framework can justify natural laws in the first place. So an atheist really has no right to use natural laws against miracles because he can't justify those natural laws. And there are good historical and legal grounds for believing the Bible accounts of miracles being true. I just want to mention one last one resource that I think I recommend very highly for you. Uh, you may have uh, seen um, this magazine here, Cre- Creation Mag. Who's seen this one? Who, anyone get, who gets this magazine? Well, quite a few of you. But uh, those who don't, I certainly recommend that you do because there's one magazine in this country which has no paid advertising and we call it the best equipping tool that we have. And that's why I'm going to give you some, uh, a chance for some sign-up uh, sheets. They're going to go round. And I want to just, uh, before, I, before they go round, I'm going to mention uh, a few things to do here. I probably, um, did you give me one of those? I'll just show you. Um, just, just pay close, close attention though. If you want to renew, this is a good time to do it. I'm going to give you some gifts as well. You see, what, what you do, when you get this thing, is to write your name and address so we can send it to you, right? We can't send it to you if you don't give it to us where you live. And then what you do is you take off this coupon. Only this coupon gets taken off. And then you take it to the nice man who's, who's helping me at the book table. Okay, at the back uh, there, waving his hand, uh, really, really, really helpful. So he will tick it off. You see, what we have is a, the coupon number matches, so we know back at the office that you're the one who's paid. If we, this is ticked off, we'll know it's you, okay? So it's very important to take the coupon off, it's all you need to do. So can these um, clipboards please go around? Thank you. And here's some of the exa- examples of things we have, and here is, is one of the issues. And here's an article in the Creation Magazine how dating methods work, and it's not about how boys are meeting girls, it's how old things are. Okay? Every issue has an interview with a Bible-believing scientist. This is Dr. Steve Voss. I think he might be coming around uh, uh, speaking to your group. Uh, he's really a top-rate scientist, geologist, PhD, and he's done work on the Grand Canyon and the Mount St. Helens, a really high-class um, geologist. And every issue has a PhD scientist. So, again, if you've got kids going through high school, they do want to do science. This is a great encouragement that they can see that there are real scientists who believe the Bible. And this is really a family magazine, so we want to equip the family, because I think, uh, by and large, uh, they're, they're horrible statistics. I mean, no matter what denomination you pick, uh, well over half the kids in that den- are leaving the church once they leave home. But the thing is, they're getting indoctrinated in the government schools, the media, everywhere, and evolution being a fact. So is it any wonder? If they haven't got answers, they're going to leave the church. That's what we want to stop. It's a terrible tragedy that, that young people are, are, are leaving the faith. And that's one thing we have a family magazine. Here's another example. How spider silk is stronger than Kevlar, which is used to make bullet, bulletproof vests. And here's an example of, of one of Darwin's icons the birds of the Galapagos. And every issue has a kid's page. We like to start the kids young. Here's my little niece here reading the Creation magazine with me at five months old. And a few other books that we have on, on display as well. I just want to recommend a few by desire I've mentioned. Uh, Creation Answers book, I really would commend you. If you haven't got that already, I think you'll find if you stay around for the Q&A time, most, in my experience, most of the questions that come up are in this Creation Answers book. So if you, know, if you know the contents of this, you can probably answer 90% of the questions that keep up, they're coming up. And uh, of course, you've got my box, Refuting Evolution, has got over half a million copies in print now, Refuting Evolution. And I get no royalties from these, because I write these books, I want to equip the church. I don't make money from these books, okay, just in case you're wondering. 
And there are a few packs there because we like to, to, to give um, discount packs. You see, we, 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 I know it's hard to choose the resources. That's why you have things like this mega pack where you've got uh, lots of books and DVDs all packaged into one with a huge discount. To try, again, to try to make it as easy as possible to equip yourself. And these are good for a lending library as well. If you have, have these books, you can lend some out after reading them. So that's another thing I'd recommend is some of the, the book packs that we have. So again, uh, thanks very much for, for uh, coming up, for inviting me to your group and, and for, for listening to me all the time. So thanks again, Doc. Thank you, Les. Let's give Dr. Jonathan a hand. <laughs> we, uh, we'll have about a 20-minute break, as he recommended, uh, to look at the books and DVDs and whatever. And then we'll come back for the Q&A. And then when that's over, you can get the refreshments as usual. Uh, by the way, those of you who got the DVD of my presentation last month didn't have any audio on it. Ooh. <laughs> but Bill, ha I remade it, and Bill has the correct versions with the audio, so you can get the free copy of the correct one. Uh, so get see Bill when you're ready, okay? Thank you. Let's break. Come back about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure we do all gathered up. Yeah.